الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده أما بعد It gives me great pleasure and I'm truly honored and humbled to be speaking to you all here in this beautiful city of Doha in the magnificent land of Qatar and it has been many many years since I have last been here and addressed um, all of you uh, and today's topic is one that is near and dear to me and it is a topic that deals with one of the most amazing sources of our religion. It is the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Some of you may know that I have um, done the seerah in the linear chronological manner in 105 lessons um, online. You'll find them on YouTube. And Alhamdulillah, I'm very, very humbled at that contribution. But the seerah is a never ending source of knowledge. And I am now going over the seerah all over again, but from a different angle, a different lens. And that is going through the seerah, looking at the seerah from different motifs, different angles. So for example, today is one example of the project I'm doing, looking at the seerah in light of stress and anxiety. How can we solve the problems of our daily life, the anxieties, the stress, the nervousness we feel through the light of the seerah? Uh, another example would be leadership through the seerah, management skills through the seerah. So we're looking at the seerah, I'm looking at the seerah through the different motifs of aspects that affect our daily life. Now, today's topic is extremely relevant to every single one amongst us. And inshallah ta'ala, I'm going to jump straight in because time is extremely limited. I have around an hour or so to talk. Actually, I've taught this seminar quite literally in day-long seminars. So this is going to be a condensed version of something I do much longer than this. And because time is limited, we're going to jump straight in. And I'm going to tell you there are five primary points that I'm going to be mentioning about this topic. Five points. So if you're able to memorize them or quickly take notes inshallah ta'ala it will be of benefit the first point the first point anxiety stress grief pain suffering this is a fact of life for the prophets and everybody beneath the prophets no one is safe from anxiety and stress in fact our prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said the strongest people who are going to be tested, the strongest tests given, the most difficult tests are going to be to the prophets and then those that follow them and then those that follow them. So we believe as Muslims that if you are righteous and pious, if you are good and inshallah Allah wants good for you, you're going to live a life that has stress in it. This is in contrast to some versions of other faith traditions. You know, I'm from Texas. I'm born and raised and live in Texas. Their version of Christianity, which is not mainstream, but their version of Christianity, their version of Christianity actually has something that they call the, the good news gospel. That if you are a righteous person, then you're going to live a comfortable life, a wealthy life. If you don't have wealth, and you don't have trials and tribulations, according to them, sorry, if you don't have wealth, and you don't have luxury, you are not beloved to God. And of course, there's a reference to this in the Quran as well. وَقَالَتِ الْيَهُدُ وَالنَّصَارَى نَحْنُ أَبْنَاءُ اللَّهِ وَأَحِبَّاؤُهُ قُلْ فَلِمَ يُعَذِّبُكُمْ بِذْنُوبِكُمْ We don't believe that if you are righteous, you shall be given this world. This is not the world that is the abode of the righteous. On the contrary, if you are truly righteous, if Allah wants good for you, if Allah wants to raise your ranks, well, that's going to be demonstrated by passing one trial after another. And in fact, the more tests and trials come down, potentially, the more beloved you are. Potentially, we're going to come back to this point. Potentially, the more beloved you are to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, the notion of pain and suffering, the reality of what we call evil in the world today, this is a very, very deep topic. And I don't have time in this seminar to go into it, but you should all be aware that the reconciling of evil, of pain, of anxiety with the existence of a loving, merciful God, it is a classical problem of philosophy. It goes back to the pre-Socratic philosophers. Every philosopher, every theologian of every religion has attempted to reconcile if God is so loving, if God is so merciful, if God is so powerful, well then, 
Why am I in pain? Why did my cousin's child die of cancer? Why did that tsunami wave come and kill those innocent people? And of course, this is, if you know your philosophy, this is the branch known as theodicy. An entire branch of philosophy deals with this one topic of anxiety and stress versus a loving God. How and why would a loving God inflict pain and anxiety am amongst the people, some of whom from ours are very innocent. Why would God do this? Again, much can be said, time is very limited, but we must, as point number one, before we move on to point number two, we must contextualize. Why are the prophets tested when they are the chosen of God? Why are those right after them tested the most? Ashaddu nas ibtilan al-anbiya. Inna Allah ta'ala idha ahabba qawman ibtilahum. Hadith in Bukhari. When Allah loves a qawm, a person, or a group of people, He shall test them. When Allah loves you, you shall be tested. But why? If Allah is ala kulli shay'in qadir, which indeed he is, and Allah is Rahman and Rahim, which indeed he is, he is Arhamur Rahimin. He is the most merciful of all who show mercy. So if Allah is the most merciful and Allah is the most powerful, then why pain? Why suffering? Why is there so much anxiety and grief? We have to answer this question before we move on to point number two. And of course, this is a topic that no exaggeration, you could do a PhD in it, the topic of theodicy. People have done PhDs in this. But Khulasatul Qur, a summary of this understanding, a summary of this reality, is that the question of trying to understand pain and suffering of evil, the question of trying to understand why is there so much evil, this question, listen to this carefully, was verbalized even before evil actually existed, even before we were created, the question was asked. This is a question that troubled the minds of a species better than us, more noble than us, holier than us, more pious than us. When Allah announced to the angels, this is in the Quran, the first story, the very first story. When Allah announced to the angels, Inni ja'irun fil ardi khalifa. I'm going to create this new creation. These are the characteristics of this creation. This is what's going to happen to this creation. What did the angels ask? The angels didn't ask, Oh Allah, how fast will this creation run? Shall they fly? How big are they? They don't care about these things. What did the angels ask? They asked this exact question that we're dealing with right now in this lecture. Why would you do this, Oh Allah? You're going to create a creation. There's going to be evil, pain, warfare, bloodshed. And here we are, pure and holy. We don't have civil war up in the heavens. There's no blood being shed in the heavens. There's no pain in the heavens. There's no suffering up here. Why would you create this creation and there's going to be evil in it? Here we are, pure, holy, نسبح, نقدس. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala replied to them. And he said, what did Allah say? Louder. Inni a'lamu ma la ta'lamun. I know what you do not know. Now, the response of the divine to the angels, this is really powerful for us as believers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not answer them in a manner that we would call philosophical. He didn't deconstruct the question. He didn't legitimize why there's pain, why there's evil, why there's suffering. On the contrary, he responded in a way that we would call faith-based. You're going to have to trust me on this one. You're going to have to trust me. You won't understand. It's beyond your pay grade to understand this. You'll never fully rationalize. And this is where we as Muslims begin the answer. By the way, there are some answers. The answer is not only Allahu A'lam. But we begin the answer by saying Allahu A'lam. We begin the answer by saying we must first and foremost, approach this question with humility. 
We must approach this question understanding Wallahu ya'lamu wa antum la ta'lamun Allah knows and you do not know We approach this question with the humility of the believer La yus'alu amma yaf'alu wa hum yus'alun No one has the right to ask Allah why he did something We on the contrary shall be asked by Allah why did you do something no one has the right to judge Allah. No one has the right to question what Allah does. And Allah will question us, why did you do what you did? So we begin this question, why is there pain? Why is there anxiety? Why is there suffering? With first and foremost saying, we have to come humbly as believers and acknowledge that Allah might do that which we don't understand. And Allah's wisdom is far more infinite than ours. He has the infinite wisdom and knowledge. And we do not have that knowledge. Does this mean, does this mean that there's absolutely no wisdom for pain and suffering? Does this mean that the Quran has no guidance for us? Why are we anxious? Why are we living sometimes with difficulty? No. The Quran is full of reasons. The Sunnah, the Seerah is full of reasons. But we begin those answers by first and foremost humbling ourselves. And I say this because, again, this is a bit of a side point here, one of my infamous tangents if you know my lectures, but a bit of a side point here. But I'm coming from America, right? In the Western world, I hope, inshallah, it's not happening over here. In the Western world, the denial of God has now become common. Atheism, agnosticism is now the fastest growing religion in all of the West. 30% of millennials say they don't believe in organized religion and God. This is in America. 30%. One third of the next generation saying we don't believe in God. In America, it's 30. In Norway, 75% of the next generation. Never in human history has this phenomenon of rejecting God been so common, so prevalent in any land, much less, you know, in some lands, more than half, two-thirds of the people. Why? Why are they rejecting God? Many, many reasons. But of the top three, and this is well known, read any book, read, you know, the books of Richard Dawkins, you know, Sam Harris, you know, Christopher Hitchens, you know, Bill Maher, listen to him. Of the top three reasons... That you ask anybody, why don't you believe in God? Oh, why would a God allow pain and suffering? Why would this God allow this evil, this anxiety, this stress? According to them, in their version, according to them, if there is a God, there should be no evil. Because there's evil, they say there's no God. Of course, by the way, this is extremely shallow. Why? Because, again, this is a bit of a tangent, but it is necessary to say this because this is a global phenomenon and we as Muslims have to counter it intellectually. Because not understanding the wisdom of Allah's actions is independent of proving Allah's existence. Allah's existence is an independent, completely separate field of understanding His actions. The two are not causally linked. The max they should say if they were true to their principles of philosophy is we don't understand why God would do this. But to link God's actions with his existence, God's existence is self-evident. You know, Descartes famously remarked, cogito ergo sum, I think therefore I am, right? This is what made Descartes famous. His level of skepticism reached so much that he even doubted his own existence. So when he discovered his existence, he became globally famous and apparently Western philosophy was launched because he figured out he existed. We don't believe in Cartesian philosophy, Descartes' philosophy. For us, it's not cogito ergo sum. For us, it is, I think, therefore he is. The fact that I think is enough of a proof that Allah exists. The fact that I exist and I have the capacity to think is enough of a proof that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists. We don't need any other proof for the existence of Allah other than our own existence. Where did we all come from? Did man think they will be left without any commandments? How did Allah create us? Where did we come from? So, the purpose of getting to this point is, of course, they are 
flawed in their rejection of God because of this. And also, they are arrogant. Why and how so? By rejecting God because there's pain and suffering, it is as if they are saying, we deserve ultimate peace and ultimate luxury and ultimate comfort by virtue of our existence. Oh God, because you created us, you must give us everything we desire. And I say, and I've said multiple times, a rejection of God is not based upon philosophical objections. It is based upon arrogance and takabur. That is where a rejection of God comes from. Now we say to such people, this world that you desire that is free of stress and anxiety, this world that you desire that has no pain, no evil, no suffering, we too desire it. In fact, we go more than you. We actually believe it exists. In fact, we aim to enter that world. The only difference is we believe that world shall be gifted by Allah when we show Him we want it. You, on the other hand, demand it after having done nothing. And when you don't get it, you throw the biggest intellectual tantrum imaginable. And you say, because this world is not here, I don't want to believe in God. And this is essentially satanic, right? Because what did Iblis do? What was Iblis's kufr? The, the kufr of Iblis was takabbur. Iblis wanted things in a certain way. When that didn't happen, Iblis said, I'm not going to worship you, O God. And by the way, no doubt Iblis is very foolish and arrogant. But the arrogance of those who reject God is worse than that of Iblis. Because Iblis did not reject the existence of God. Iblis rejected the worship of God. Which is bad, but it's not as bad as those who reject God. The point being, we also want a world that is stress-free. But here's the point. Where is that world? It's the next world. And it is called the stress-free world. It is literally called the world of no pain, no stress, no anxiety. Allah calls it in the Quran, Wallahu yad'u ila daris salam. Allah calls you to the abode of peace. What is Darus Salam? Darus Salam is the abode where there is no pain, there is no suffering, there is no anguish, there is no anxiety. It exists, but it shall be given to those who desire it, those who strive for it, those who put in the effort and show their creator they want it. So when they put in the effort, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless them and give them that abode of anxiety. So therefore, why is there anxiety in this world? Why is there stress in this world? Multiple things. We'll quickly go over some of them before we move to point two. Although this is still point one, don't worry. I know where I'm going, inshallah. We're still on time and we're going to go over all five points. Of the wisdoms of why there's anguish and pain and suffering is because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to test those amongst us who truly want the abode of no pain and suffering versus those who don't care about it. Allah says in the Quran, He created death and life to test you. Ibtila. This world is Darul Ibtila, Darul Ikhtibar, Darul Imtihan. And the next is Darul Hisab. This world is the abode of test. If we understand this concept, then all of a sudden we begin to contextualize why is there difficulty in this world. Brothers and sisters, understand no human being on earth lives a stress-free life. You need to understand this point. You know sometimes people see on Instagram a distant friend or, and they think, oh, what an amazing life they're living. It's all fake. Facebook is fake. Instagram is fake. No one is living a stress-free life. Every human being, without exception, is battling inner and outer demons. Every human being has issues. And subhanAllah, the very same issue for some people, having it brings stress. For others, not having it brings stress. Such is the way of life. We are never, ever eternally happy in this world.
For some people, their wealth is a source of stress. The stock market going up and down, their investments, they have plenty, but it's causing so much stress for them. For others, not having wealth is a source of stress. For some people, children and the stress that comes with children is their major source of stress. And for others, being childless is a source of stress. For some people, their relationships, their marriages causes issues. For others, being single is a source of stress. This is the reality of life. And in fact, another interesting point, Ibn al-Qayyim remarks this in his book, ad wa dawa Ibn al-Qayyim says, and before him, Ibn Taymiyyah has a similar statement. Ibn al-Qayyim says, there is not a single object of this world that gives you happiness and comfort except that it shall also cause pain and suffering proportional to the amount of comfort you get from it. Think about this. There's not a single object of this world that brings you happiness except that it shall also cause you grief and pain and anguish. Is this not true? There's only one thing that is nothing but good, and that is your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your iman in Allah, your ibadah, your, your, your attachment to Allah, your spirituality, that is the one thing that is 100% positive, shall not have any negatives. So we have to understand, pain and suffering is a part and parcel of our existence. And the wisdom of it being here is very clear. لِيَمِيزَ اللَّهُ الْخَبِيثَ مِنَ الطَّيِّبِ أَمْ حَسِبَتُمْ أَنْ تُتْرَكُوا وَلَمَّا يَعْلَمِ اللَّهُ لَنِي جَاهَدُمْ كُرْعَمُ الصَّابِرِينَ أَيَحْسَبُ الْإِنسَانُ أَنْ يُتْرَكَ سُدَى أَلِفْ لَا مِيمْ أَحَسِبَ النَّاسُ أَنْ يُتْرَكُوا أَنْ يَقُولُوا آمَنَّا وَهُمْ لَا يُفْتَنُونَ Multiple verses are telling us, do you really think you're not going to be tested? Do you think this life is going to be a piece of cake? We tested the people before you. We're going to test you as well. And the purpose of the test is to see who amongst us does the best deeds. Who amongst us passes one test after another. And that's why going through tests with full conviction, going through tests with faith is of the highest ways to enter the highest levels of paradise. Passing these tests is the way we attain a stress-free life in the hereafter. We have to understand this point. The purpose or one of the purposes of these tests is so that Allah Azza wa Jal can see amongst us who truly has faith, who truly has tawakkul, who truly puts trust in Allah, has patience for the sake of Allah, and who doesn't. And in proportionality to our tests shall be our places in heaven. وَلِكُلِّنْ دَرَجَاتٌ مِمَّا عَمِلُوا Depending on your amal, shall be your darajat in heaven. Heaven is not one level. Heaven is not one maqam, one degree. Heaven has more degrees than we can imagine. And who shall get the highest levels? Who shall get the very highest of the high? Allah tells us in the Quran. Allah tells us in the Quran that when the people enter the highest levels, there is a, a, a level of Jannah called the ghuraf, the VIP suites, right? It's in the Quran. There's ghuraf, VIP suites. Allah tells us in the Quran, when the people enter those VIP suites, they will be told why they entered it. وَالْمَلَائِكَةُ يَدْخُلُونَ عَلَيْهِم مِّن كُلِّ بَابِ سَلَامٌ عَلَيْكُمْ بِمَا صَبَرْتُمْ فَنِعْمَ عُقْبَ الدَّارِ The angels will say, peace be unto you, because you were patient. So, in responding to trials, and in being patient, one trial after another, we earn our reward with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, does this mean, does this mean that we should ask for more trials? Does this mean that we should want to be tested even more? Here is a really interesting point. It's a little bit, a little bit, you know, you have to pay attention. So I ask you to, to, to pay attention to the next few minutes, especially, or else you'll be confused. While it is true, that the more tests that come and the more we pass those tests, the higher we rise, we actually, as Muslims, ask Allah to not test us. Why? Because we're worried we might fail the tests. 
We are worried we might fail the tests. So we ask Allah to avert any difficulty from us. We ask Allah, as the Prophet advised his uncle Al Abbas, Salillah al Afiyah. Allahumma inna nas'aluka al Afiyah fi dini wa dunya. Oh Allah, we ask that you don't test us in this world or in our religion. We ask Allah for no tests. So then, what do we do when a test comes? When a test comes, we need to understand that Allah has chosen us and given us the opportunity that other people are not being given. The hadith in Bukhari, our Prophet ﷺ said, لا تتمنوا لقاء العدو Don't desire to meet the enemy. Don't desire to be put in a test. But if you find yourself on the battlefield, then be firm and be patient and fight the way Allah wants you to. Don't desire to be put in that situation. But if you find yourself there, well then, stand up and do what Allah wants you to do. That's our attitude. It's literally this attitude. If Allah has chosen to send a test upon us that other people are not tested with. If we have a calamity, a musibah, an anxiety, a stress that is far above what anybody else has, well then realize, Allah has given you the opportunity to rise up far above anybody else. And this leads me again to another point. Again, we're still in point number one here. Don't worry guys, I'm still following track of time. Still in point number one. This notion... That if I'm being tested, God doesn't love me. Allah's angry with me if I'm being tested. This notion, we need to remove it from our minds. We need to get rid of it. It is not a part of our Islamic theology to think bad thoughts of our Creator. We have good thoughts of Allah, husna dhan in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, in the beginning of the Risala Muhammad, in the beginning of the Seerah, our Prophet Sallallahu had similar thoughts. Perhaps Allah is angry with me. And Allah revealed, مَا وَدَّعَكَ رَبُّكَ وَمَا قَلَى وَلَا الْآخِرَةُ خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنَ الْأُولَى Your Lord has neither abandoned you, nor is He angry with you. And indeed, the future shall be brighter for you than yesterday was. The future shall be brighter. We always think optimistically of Allah. Somebody will say, but the Quran clearly says, that when a calamity comes, it's because of my sins. It's in the Quran. Any musibah comes, it's because of what you've done. I respond, finish the verse. Don't just give me half the verse. Finish the verse. Because of this calamity, much of your sins shall be forgiven. So, here's our mindset, brothers and sisters. The purpose of anxiety, stress, grief, suffering. The Prophet ﷺ said, "Ma asaba abdun qat la hamun wa la hazanun." No pain, no anxiety, no stress, no grief afflicts a mu'min, and they are patient, except that Allah will forgive their sins and raise their ranks. Even a thorn pricks them; that shall give them reward. We don't want to be tested. But when the test comes, understand, Allah has given you the opportunity to rise above others. And if He's given you that opportunity, He knows you shall pass the test if you want to do so. Allah never sets you up for failure. لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. You know, a lot of times when the test comes, we're like, I can't do this. I can't pass this. This is too much for me. And I say, no, never think this. Never think that the test is too much for you. On the contrary, you have to have certainty that you're going to pass the test. How can you doubt yourself when Allah has not doubted you? Allah has not doubted you. Allah has tested you because He knows you can pass the test. It's in the Quran. You're not going to be tested with more than what you can bear. So if you find yourself in a difficult test, guess what? 
Allah trusts you. And Allah knows you can pass the test. You have within you the iman, the fortitude, the taqwa, the tawakkul. You have in you all of the tools that you need to pass that test. But you have to turn to Allah and discover those tools. Don't give up and say, why am I being tested? How is this happening to me? No. So, if Allah loves someone, he shall test them. And the more he loves them, the more they shall be tested. We don't want tests and trials. Nobody wants it. But when it comes unto us, then know Allah Azza wa Jal has chosen. It's literally like, you know, imagine in a battle, the general is talking to his army and he says, I'm going to choose one warrior to go and, you know, do the battle and start and whatnot. Nobody wants to be that warrior. But imagine when the name is called and the warrior stands up, there is an element of pride. There is an element of honor being given. وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَى To Allah belongs the most perfect example. If Allah has called you and chosen you and asked you to stand up for a higher test, well then guess what? That means He wants you to go much higher. How about the issue of because of my sins that the Quran says? The response. Why are you looking at it as a binary either or? Yes, every calamity is because of something we've done. But rather than looking at it as a punishment, look at it as an expiation, a kafara. Allah wants to get rid of your sins now so that you're scot-free in the next life. Allah wants to cleanse you here and now so that the qabr is shining bright, so that the hereafter is firdaus al-a'la, so that you can go to Jannah bi ghayri hisab. And in order to do that, you have to go through some trials in this world. So don't look at it as a binary, I'm being punished because I'm evil. Rather, this is a test. I know I've done something and this is going to cleanse my sins, but I'm going to come out a stronger, a better person. I'm going to come out, inshallah ta'ala, passing this test. So this is point number one. All of this is point number one. And that is tests and trials, anxiety and stress, grief and pain, suffering. Not only is it a part and parcel of existence, it is actually, actually from, for us as Muslims, a potential sign that Allah loves you more than he loves other people. So we need to have that in our minds, a, a positive attitude towards Allah. The technical term, husna dhan billah. A positive attitude towards Allah. You are not being punished because you're evil. You are being given the chance to redeem yourselves, to, to rise to new heights that you would otherwise never have gotten to. Allah knows you deserve higher than what you have right now. Allah knows you have the potential to shine, but for whatever reason, you're not shining. So, Allah in His wisdom decided to inflict upon you something, pain, suffering, something was blocking your potential. So if Allah removed it, in order for you to rise to your potential, that is not a punishment. That is a blessing in disguise. I say to you bluntly, brothers and sisters, I say to you bluntly, anything that brings you closer to Allah, it is a blessing. Anything that causes you to increase your spirituality and attachment, to recognize your own mortality, to make you more conscious of your finite life on this earth so that you can prepare for the infinite life in the next life, this is a blessing unto you. There is no evil if you come out of evil a better person, a stronger person. That was a gift Allah gave to you. Point number two now. We're moving on, don't worry. We're going to do five points. Point number two. We learn from the seerah that tests and trials, stress and anxiety are going to impact you. You're going to feel stressed out. You're going to feel anxiety. You're going to feel sadness. Now this might seem a very obvious point to some of you. Good for you. Unfortunately, some people have misunderstood the religion. And some people will tell you when a tragedy happens, when you're feeling down and depressed, when you're sad, some people will tell you if you have Iman, you won't feel sad. If you have Iman, you won't be depressed. Why are you sad, brother? Why are you depressed, sister? This means you don't have Iman. Why are you feeling anxiety? This means your faith must be weak. And rather than help you, they make you feel even more guilty. You're already suffering. Now you're being told you're suffering because you don't have faith in God. Right? That's why my point number two, which might seem self-evident, but it needs to be said. 
No matter how strong your iman is, no matter how strong your faith in your creator is, it's normal and okay. It is prophetic to feel anxiety and grief and stress. Our qari right now that recited the verses, beautiful verses, they're actually one of my favorite verses in the Quran, Surah Al-Hijr, conclusion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ نَعْلَمُ أَنَّكَ يَضِيقُ صَدْرُكَ بِمَا يَقُولُونَ we know, Ya Rasulullah, your heart is in anguish and stress because of the lies that they say. Your heart is feeling the pain because of rumors, slanders, innuendos. Is anybody, astaghfirullah, going to say, weak iman, la hawla khusala billah? Allah says in the Quran, Surah Al-Kahf, لَعَلَّكَ بَاخِعُ النَّفْسَكَ أَلَّا يَكُونُ مُؤْمِنِينَ Your stress might physically harm you, Ya Rasulullah in your desire that they accept Islam. We know from the seerah multiple incidents where the Prophet Sallallahu was anxious, was sad, was even, even he was crying Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In the famous incident of the Battle of Mu'ta, when Zayd ibn Haritha was killed and Abdullah ibn ja uh, uh, and Ja'far uh, ibn Abi Talib and Abdullah ibn Rawaha when they were all massacred in the Battle of Mu'ta, very tragic story. Go read the seerah or listen to the seerah. And of course, Zayd, by the way, who is Zayd? And what will make you understand who Zayd is? Zayd is the one Sahabi Allah mentioned by name in the Quran. Even Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu an is not mentioned by name. He's mentioned by a proper pronoun. Idi yaqulu li sahibihi, ay Abu Bakr as Siddiq. As for Zayd, falamma qada Zaydun minha wa tara. Zayd is the only Sahabi mentioned by name in the Quran. Zayd. Who will make you understand who is Zayd? The day our Prophet passed away, our mother, our mother Aisha remarked, and Aisha is the daughter of Abu Bakr, our mother Aisha remarked, if Zayd were alive today, no one would have chosen my father over him. This is Aisha saying, if Zayd were alive today, he would have been the choice over my father. But subhanAllah, most of us have no clue who Zayd is. Zayd is the quote-unquote adopted son before Islam of the Prophet He adopted him, then Allah abolished this notion of adoption. By the way, adoption here means tabanni, you call a child your son. As for adoption of taking a child and raising, that's fully Islamic. But to claim the child is yours, no, that's not Islamic. So Allah abolished, we shouldn't say adoption, Allah abolished tabanni which is to claim this child as your own. Allah did not abolish the Western concept of adoption, which we say. It's not haram to take a child and raise the child. It's haram to say the child is yours. Zayd was considered for a period of time to be the child of our Prophet Ibn Umar said, Ibn Abbas said, we never knew that Zayd was not the son of the Prophet until Allah revealed Surah Al-Ahzab. For 10 years, he thought the biological son of the Prophet then Allah revealed Surah Al-Ahzab. Call them by their fathers. Then Zayd used to be called Zayd ibn Muhammad, by the way. He used to be called Zayd ibn Muhammad. Then he was called Zayd ibn Haritha. Now, Zayd, to so understand how beloved he was, I'm trying to explain. He was loved like a son, raised like a son. That bond was there even though it wasn't biological. And Aisha radiallahu anha says, I was looking at the Prophet in the masjid, as he was describing the battle of Mu'tah. Pause here. What do I mean by this? Allah blessed the Prophet with a miracle, a mu'jizah. He was giving a play-by-play -play of the battle of Mu'tah, live. The battle of Mu'tah is taking place above Tabuk, 950 you know, kilometers above Medina. And the Prophet is in Medina. And as the battle is taking place, the Sahaba are listening play by play exactly what's happening. And the process is going over scene by scene. And he's seeing it. Jibreel Allah allowed him to see that battle. And then Aisha says, when Zayd was killed, he's seeing it. When Zayd was killed, Aisha said, the life went from his face. We could see the huzun in his face. His face became pale. Stop talking. And he sat down from the grief. This is what we call in English shock. He's just seen and heard the news that is going to bring this to him. He can't speak. Color leaves his face. 
and he's so overcome with emotion, he has to physically sit down. Can anybody say that if you have Iman, you're not going to feel sad? Can anybody say that strong faith means you're never going to be anxious and never going to feel grief? Wallahi, I don't know what seerah they're reading, what books of even tafsir they're reading. The seerah, the Quran is full of the reality of the humanity of feeling pain and suffering regardless of who you are. I say bluntly, Iman has nothing to do with feeling sad and grief. Yes, it has to do with how you cope with it. But how you feel it? No. Understand this point. Point number two, because point number three, we're going to come there. Point number two, Iman has nothing to do with feeling sad. You can feel sad. You can be grief struck. Our Prophet cried multiple times. Multiple times. Is anybody going to say this is a lack of Iman? His son Ibrahim, the, daughter, the son of, of Mahdi al Qibtiya, his son Ibrahim, he had a breathing issue, asthma, he was gasping for breath. And in his hands, two and a half years old, that beautiful, sweet, tender age, right? And Ibrahim dies in his hand. And our Prophet begins to cry. And the Sahaba, some of them haven't seen him cry that often. By the way, he did cry a few times. I've looked over the seerah. There's multiple times he cried, but it's not that often. Less than the fingers on one hand. So the Sahaba didn't see him that often cry. So a Sahabi became perplexed. And he said, hadith is in Bukhari, Awatabki ya Rasulullah. Like he's never seen him, this Sahabi. You also cry, ya Rasulullah. He's never seen him. You also cry, ya Rasulullah. Listen to this. Al-Buka'u rahmatun. This is a hadith. Crying is a mercy, rahmah, that Allah has placed in the hearts of His believers. Is anybody going to say that feeling sad means you don't have iman? Wallahi, again, I don't know which books they're reading, which seerah they're reading. I don't see this at all. His son has passed away. What else is he going to do? He's crying and he says to Allah, we are sad, O Ibrahim, that you have left us, but we say what will please Allah, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un, inna ala firaqirak al-mahzunun, but we only say, ma yurdi Allah azza wa jal, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Point is that he is crying. So, point number two, let nobody guilt trip you. Let nobody tell you that if you had Iman, you wouldn't feel sad. If you had Iman, you wouldn't feel anxiety. If you had Iman, you wouldn't be stressed out. It is normal to feel stressed out and grief and anxious for worldly problems and for religious problems. Aisha radiallahu anha says that كَانَ نَبِيُّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ إِذَا فَزِعَهُ أَمْرٌ When something perturbed him, if something made him anxious, right, he would rush to pray. He would stand up to pray salah. If something troubled him, he would stand up to pray. Some things are troubling him. So, point number two, Iman and feeling anxiety when you hear a news, when something happens to you, they are not mutually exclusive. There's no causal relationship, or I should say inverse relationship. It doesn't mean the stronger your Iman, the less anxiety will come to you. No. When a loved one dies, when a calamity happens, when a, you are overstruck with grief, it is normal, 100% normal to feel in fact, again, I'm summarizing a lot because much can be said. One more incident, then we move on to point number three. One more incident. Beautiful incident that shows us the reality of shock. The incident of Ta'if. The incident of Ta'if. Our mother Aisha radiallahu anha, she didn't know the Meccan seerah because meaning she didn't watch it live. She didn't, you know, she wasn't uh, uh, watching Meccan seerah. She was too young. So she knows the Madani seerah. She's lived through the Madani seerah. And she has seen the battle of Uhud. And she knows the pain and the anguish that happened in the battle of Uhud. Multiple wounds, bleeding for two weeks, right? Three times assassination attempts in the battle of Uhud. Three separate attempts to assassinate the process in the battle of Uhud. Lost his uncle, lost 70 of the Sahaba. So she says, O Messenger of Allah, was there any day more painful to you than the battle of Uhud? Any day more painful than Uhud? The Prophet said immediately, yes. The day of Ta'if was more difficult than Uhud. The day of Ta'if was more difficult than Uhud. When the chieftains of Mecca rejected me. Now he didn't go into detail, but we know from the seerah, the public mockery of the Prophet was unparalleled on that day. The entire city 
saying vulgar things, nasty things, laughing about him. And subhanallah, this is a pain that was worse than Uhud. You know, when we're children, we were taught that nursery rhyme, sticks and stones may break my bones, but, but words don't hurt you or don't hurt me. Nothing could be further from the truth. Sometimes words hurt more than a physical pain. Sometimes slander, sometimes a loved one's statement pierces your heart like a bullet. And our Prophet being the dignified, kareem, noble man that he was, to be mocked in that manner hurt him more than the physical pains of Uhud. You understand this point? So he said, I left the city and I did not know where I was until I got to Qarn al-Manazil. Now this is a, just, it's glossed over in the seerah, but I looked this up, where is this Qarn? Uh, where is this Qarn al Where is this place Qarn al Where is it? And I found out this is a place that is two-thirds of the way between Ta'if and Mecca, closer to Mecca. And it takes around four to five hours to walk from Ta'if to Qarn al this phrase is powerful. I had no idea of time, space, until the next thing I know, I'm there. And this is what we call shock. No recollection of what's going on until finally I find myself over here. Again, brothers and sisters, don't let anybody guilt trip you that because you're in shock, because you're in pain, because your heart is in anguish, that this means you don't have iman. This is point number two. It is normal, it is human, it is prophetic to grieve, to cry, to feel the pain. Allah empathized. And by the way, this is another point here. Part of the therapy, when somebody's in pain, you validate their pain. You don't dismiss it. When you dismiss somebody else's pain, you exacerbate it, you make it worse. You empathize. Why is Allah saying, we know it hurts, Ya Rasulullah. Why is Allah saying, be patient, Ya Rasulullah. Turn away from these people. We know what, what's going through. Allah Azza wa Jal is validating the pain and anguish of our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is therapy. This is therapeutic. Next time your friend, your cousin, your mother, your sibling is in pain, Hug them. Say, I know it must be difficult. Allah, make it easy for you. Don't say, oh, you're in pain because you're a bad Muslim. <laughs> Subhanallah. What psychology is this? What therapy is this? You're making things worse by saying this. So, point number two, totally normal. You get the point, okay? Point number three. Now, here I'm going to be blunt. I'm shall always being blunt. But I said point number two, your iman and feeling anguish when you hear the news... There's no relationship between them. You can have strong iman and still cry, still sit down. But point number three, from the seerah we learn that as soon as you hear of a tragedy, as soon as the news of something anxious or problem reaches you, you must turn to Allah spiritually, emotionally, and verbally. You must establish an immediate connection with Allah. And if you delay in establishing this connection, now I will be blunt here and tell you, this is a weakness of Iman. To feel anxious, no problem. To delay in connecting to Allah, yes, a problem. Two different things. The lag that you have between hearing the news and between contextualizing why this is happening, understanding Allah has chosen you, understanding this is a test and trial, and inshallah I'm going to pass it. Allah will help me to pass it. Because there is a lag. There's always a lag, right? The mu'min minimizes this lag. In fact, we can flip the script. The lag indicates your strength of iman. The longer the time frame, the weaker your iman. And the shorter the time frame, the stronger your iman. Our Prophet has Ibrahim in his hands. And subhanAllah, 
as soon as the ruh leaves, as soon as the ruh leaves, he says, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. Zero time lag. Instantaneous. This is Iman. Now, we turn to Allah spiritually. We say, الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتُمْ مُصِيبَةٍ It's in the Quran. This is Quranic and prophetic. الَّذِينَ إِذَا أَصَابَتُمْ مُصِيبَةٍ قَالُوا إِنَّا لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّا إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ We say this phrase. We turn to Allah. We go back to point number one so that we understand why is this happening? What is the purpose of tests and trials? What is anxiety going to gain? Why is Allah testing me? إِنَّا لِلَّهِ Everything here belongs to Allah. Whatever Allah took away, a loved one, wealth, health, status, whatever was taken away, it wasn't yours to begin with in the first place. It's not yours. If you don't have something, it's not yours in the first place. Everything we have belongs to Him. So if Allah chose to take it back, well then, He's the Malik al-Mulk. Who am I to say anything? And, وَإِنَّ إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ is a consolation. How is it a consolation? Whatever was taken away, if it's an actual person, you shall be reunited with this person when you go back to Allah. It's temporary. And if it is something else, health or wealth or status or something, well, if you're patient, what you will get with Allah is better than what you lost. So, وَإِنَّ إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ is a time consolation. No tragedy of this world is permanent. Find comfort in this. No pain in this world is permanent. Nothing in this dunya is permanent. So if we are patient and turn to Allah, whatever tragedy we have, when we are reunited with Allah, if it's a loved one, we're going to be with that person, inshallah. And if it's other than this, well then, whatever we don't have, whatever was taken away, we will get something better with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, point number three. When tragedy strikes, when calamity befalls us, when the source of anxiety is brought up in front of us, we shall turn to Allah spiritually, emotionally, and verbally. And the reason we do so, this is theological therapy. We have to understand why pain is happening. We have to contextualize who we are, who is Allah, and that Allah has the right to test us, and that this test is temporary, and that we shall pass this test, and when we pass it, everything will be fine in the Akhirah. So, and I said also, by the way, the, the, the lag here, this is beautifully shown in a hadith which we need to mention. A prophet, the Prophet was walking in the streets of Medina in the seerah uh, lessons we have. And this also is Sahih Bukhari. And he saw a woman sitting in front of a grave crying. Her husband had died or somebody had died. So the Prophet said to her, Ya Amatallah, O oh, female servant of Allah, litasbir, litasbiri, be patient. And Expect Allah to reward you for your loss. Be patient and inshallah things will get better and Allah will reward you for your loss. She did not recognize the voice. She didn't turn around and she did not recognize the voice. And she said, Ilayka anni. Literally, get away from me. For you do not understand the calamity of what has happened. Before I move on, Hurt people, hurt people. Let that sink in. Hurt people, hurt people. A lot of times when somebody's rude or nasty with you, Wallahi, you need to empathize and understand. Maybe something's happening with them that I don't know. And they're lashing out at me, not because of me, but because of them. And at that point in time, you have to be the better person. Our Prophet ﷺ, being who he was, dignified, silent, walk away. No need to respond. She's not in a state of mind to respond right now. This is how you respond. Now, of course, the Prophet ﷺ walked away. What do you think the companions are going to do? They went up to her. Have you gone mad? Do you not know who he was? 
that was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam all of a sudden palpitating, hyperventilating, rushed to the masjid. Ya Rasulullah, please forgive me. I didn't recognize you. And our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in order to teach her and all of us, factually, he wasn't rude. Factually, because we need to learn our lesson. Most of you know this hadith. This, but this is the context of the hadith. Inna sabru inda sadmatil ula. He told her and through her, all of us. Patience is demonstrated at the first stroke of the calamity. The way you acted was not befitting and it wasn't patient. Even if it wasn't the Prophet she was rude. Even if it was an average person, she was downright rude. There was no need to do what she did. And our Prophet factually said, you want to demonstrate your sabr? And you know, this is the beauty. Subhanallah, wallahi, Allah created us in such a beautiful manner. Everybody copes with tragedy after a period of time. Everybody. Even the kafir. Whatever happens, give him a few days or weeks or whatever, you know, cancer, come over. after a while, he'll become stoic, okay? And he'll deal with it. Iman comes in to minimize that lag. That's what it is, right? Iman comes in to bring about a little bit of comfort as soon as possible. And that's point number three. When the calamity happens, when you're dealing with the anxiety and stress, you must spiritually and verbally turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that will help you. Again, go back to the hadith I said it a few minutes ago. Whenever something troubled the Prophet he would rush to stand up in salah. Connecting with the divine is the beginning of theological therapy. Without that therapy, getting rid of the anxiety and stress is almost impossible, very difficult. So this is point number three. Point number four, and time is coming up, so I have to hurry up a little bit. But we'll go over all five, as I said, inshallah. Point number four. Point number four. From the seerah we learn. From the seerah we learn that we don't allow anxiety and stress and grief to overpower and incapacitate us. No. We stand up, we collect our wits, we tighten our belts, and we march forward. We move on and we try to combat that anxiety and stress in a worldly and a spiritual manner. If it is something we can change, if we don't have a job, financial crisis, health issue, well then, we go knock on doors, send our resumes out, go to the hospital, go to the doctor. You don't just sit and expect a miracle to happen while you do nothing. And if it is something we cannot change, the death of a loved one, you can't bring the loved one back, even then, we collect our wits and we move on with life. Point number four, we do not allow a tragedy to shape us and incapacitate us. We don't allow anxiety and stress to overpower us. That's not a part of the seerah. That's not a part of the sunnah. That's not a part of the prophetic methodology. No matter how great the tragedy, you must stand up and move on. Even if it's catastrophic. Subhanallah. One, you know, sometimes I wonder how our mother and father, Adam and Hawa, how they would have lived their first few days on this earth after being in Jannah. I want you to imagine that. I don't have time to go into detail. I just want you to imagine being in Jannah and they simply desire and it's given to them. And all of a sudden they find themselves alone. No civilization. They don't know how to cultivate yet. They don't know how to hunt yet. They haven't discovered the Bronze Age. They don't have tools yet. They have to imagine Wallahi, any problem we have, it is trivial compared to that. They had to move on. They lost Jannah, but they still have to move on. That's life. You don't allow a past tragedy to make you morbid and go down the routes of, I can't do anything, I can't live anywhere. No, you're going to move on. You're going to have to collect your wits and go forward. Even if it's painful. We learn from Ibn Hisham tells us in the seerah, after the death of Khadija, radiallahu ta'ala anha, the Prophet was not seen smiling for a full year. That's painful. The death of Khadija shook him to the core. He didn't find happiness in anything for a year. And yet, 
in Shama'il of Tirmidhi, we learn from Anas ibn Malik. And Anas didn't see him in Mecca, Anas saw him in Medina. Anas ibn Malik said, I never saw anybody أَكْثَرُ تَبَسُّمًا مِنَ النَّبِيِّ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمُ I never saw anybody smile more than the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. This is the reality. Took a while. It's not, you know, sometimes it's going to take. And if it's Khadija to the Prophet a year. But eventually, he becomes the most smiling, the most. This is the reality of life. You have to move on. You have to do things. You can't just sit back and do nothing. You have to combat the source of that anxiety and stress. The entire seerah, one tactic after another. The Prophet didn't just sit at home waiting for miracles. The Quraysh did what they did. He had to even flee to Mecca, Medina. The battle of Badr, the battle of Uhud, da'wah tactics, writing letters to the rulers. All of it is combating so that you get results done. The same goes for anything in our life that is causing us stress and grief. You have to minimize work towards it. And that's why simple reality of being sick. The Prophet ﷺ was asked, Ya Rasulullah, when we're sick, should we take medicine, go to the doctor, get treatments? Naam, Ya Ibadallah, tadawo. Yes, go and seek treatment. Go and do the asbab. Yes, Allah is the one who is musabbibul asbab. We all know. But Allah created channels. Allah created routes and passages to get to the end result. If, if you want to get to the end result, you have to walk on those passages. If you sit at home, it will never happen. And you must force yourself to move on. Beautiful hadith uh, from the Ummahat al-Mu'mineen, our mothers, that our uh, mother Safiya, you know, Safiya was from the Jewish tribe. She converted. And so she didn't have any family in Medina. She had no family. She's, you know, not from the tribes of Medina, right? And she had one brother who would live in Medina for a while and come and go. Uh, after the Prophet uh, passed away, one brother that uh, she had. And this brother passed away as well. So she has lost the Prophet him. She lost her brother as well. She had no one left. And she really, really felt down. We learn, hadith is in Bukhari. That on the third day, she told her servant to bring my clothes from that box and bring my perfume and comb my hair. She put on the clothes. She put on the perfume. She combed her hair. And then she said to her servant, and because of this is preserved in our tradition, she said, Wallahi, I have no desire to do this. But I heard the Prophet Sallallahu say, it is not allowed to grieve for another person for more than three days. And today is the third day. This is Islam. You can't just live in the past. You can't just be overpowered and that's it. No. You have to force yourself to move on. No matter how painful it is. You cannot be incapacitated because of something, because of a tragedy, because of an issue. No. Allah Azza wa Jalla will give you the strength. We learned this as well. S small things, subhanAllah. We talked about the battle of Mu'tah. We talked about, you know, um, uh, Zayd being killed. Well, Ja'far was also killed. And Ja'far was the, the brother cousin of the Prophet. Ja'far was the older brother of Ali, right? And he grew up in that household of Ali, uh, of um, uh, Abu Talib. So he's grown up in Abu Talib's household. And Ja'far is his age, unlike Ali, who was much younger than him. Ja'far is like his brother ish almost, his brother cousin, right? Ja'far died in the battle of Mu'tah. And when Ja'far died, the Prophet visited his cousin brother. This is the closest he has to a brother. Now these children are orphans. And Abdullah ibn Ja'far was seven, eight years old. And he had a bunch of brothers and sisters. He narrates the story as a child. He says, when my father died, Shaheed, the Prophet came to visit us, right? He told Aisha and others to send food to their house. And he said, they are too busy to cook themselves. Notice these small things, right? Notice this micromanaging. This is empathy. This is taking care. No matter how hurt they are, no matter how sad they are, they have to eat food, right? They might not realize it. We'll take care of it. Here, have some food. The Prophet himself micromanaged, giving food to the family. Then he goes and visits them. And three days had gone by. In these three days, the kids had no shower, dirty clothes, disheveled hair, because the mother is in grief, you know? The Prophet came and hugged us. Look, the physical empathy, 
This is the seerah's teaching us. You give your empathy to other people. You make them feel better. And he told us that my father now has two wings in Jannah. What does this mean? So Jafar died a tragic death. His hands were cut off. And the spread to the people, his hands had been cut off. The Prophet is cheering them up. He doesn't have two hands anymore. He has two wings. He's flying in Jannah. Allah gave him. Again, cheering up. And then, and wallahi, this blew my mind when I, I'm going through the seerah, like I explained to you, looking for these types of things. This little phrase that I had said in my seerah, I looked over it. All of a sudden, it just, it made, it just literally, like, unbelievable. The, the level of empathy, the psychology of the Prophet Wasallam. The hadith tells us, he saw our condition, and he called for a barber, and got us haircuts, and he brought new clothes for us. They've just become an orphan. They've lost their father. But this is not how you live your life to go back to the past and just mull in your tragedy. Life has to go on. And no matter what's happened, the seven-year-old kid getting a new thobe, getting a new haircut, what's going to happen? Isn't he going to feel happy? Isn't he going to say, hey, look, mama, look at my new thobe here. Look at this. This is what you call the seerah. Giving positive energy, making people feel happy, getting them back to their lives. You cannot allow a past tragedy to shape the rest of your entire life. That's not what our religion teaches us. No matter how painful it is, tighten up your belt and get to work. Move on with life until you have no life to move on and other people's life will move on. You know, you're sad if somebody has passed away. You feel guilty being, being happy when they, after they passed away. What, when you pass on, do you want your children to just live in grief for the rest of your life? That's not what our religion teaches us. Death is inevitable. Tragedy is going to happen. So, point number four. We don't combat anxiety by exacerbating it. We challenge it. Dunya and deen. We try our best to minimize it. We actively engage in overcoming these issues. Even if it's the small issues of how we dress and how we eat and whatnot. Because these are normal things of life. And that's why, by the way, the beauty, again, the beauty of our sharia, for three days we're allowed a bit of laxity, right? So for three days, if you are overcome and whatnot, khair, okay, no big deal. Three days. But after the third day of the death of somebody, you have to get back to work. The sharia allows you for three days, you take a bit of a vacation from life. SubhanAllah, how beautiful is our sharia? For three days, you know, you're not taking care of yourself fully. Of course, you still have to pray, you still have to do the farad. But other than that, you know, like no phone calls, no texts, no messages. I just don't want to go to work. Khair, okay, Allah has allowed you. Grieve, overcome. But on the third day, get your act together and get back to your life as much as you can. This is what the seerah teaches us. Last and final point, and again, this is a very deep point, and yet it's a very simple one. We all understand it. Dealing with anxiety and stress. We learn from the seerah that of the most powerful ways to deal with anxiety and stress is through the medium of worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Worshipping Allah is therapeutic for our souls. Forget the thawab for now. It's going to help us overcome stress. Connecting with Allah is the most powerful antidote to anxiety. And especially out of all of the rituals, that of dua. That of invoking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for our needs. That of asking Allah for our wants. Because dua is the weapon of the believer. Dua is a private conversation with Allah. Dua is opening up your heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and expressing the realities of how you feel. So that Allah azza wa jal, who is Samir, who is Basir, who is Al-Wadud, who is Al-Kareem, He can then heal within you. And especially dua that is done in the last third of the night. Especially that dua. Because our Prophet ﷺ said, that is when Allah Himself comes down and says, who is asking me? I shall give him what he wants. So, praying tahajjud, which was the sunnah of our Prophet ﷺ, and making dua within tahajjud, and making dua in the last third of the night. And a lot of people, they misunderstand dua. 
One of the most common questions that any sheikh gets asked, including me, one of the most common questions, somebody comes to me or to any sheikh and says, Sheikh, I'm suffering from, and he gives a detailed description, this, 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 what dua should I make? As if we have a big, masterful book of du'as in our office, right? Secret book of du'as that only sheikhs have. So we go to our office, pull it out, flip the pages. Then we say, ah, your page number, you know, volume number two. The best du'a you can make is the du'a that comes from your heart. Unscripted. Raise your hands to Allah and pour out your heart to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the reality. For the, we, again, Sirah is chock full of this. The Battle of Badr. The Prophet spent the entire night in dua. The whole night from Isha to Fajr. So much so, Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu felt, Say, Ya Rasulullah, enough. Allah has heard your dua. He's going to answer you. The whole night in dua to Allah. Oh Allah, if you don't help us to, today, you shall not be worshipped on earth after today. The whole night he's praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What dua does? is opening up a private conversation. Direct office hours with the divine. Nobody else except you and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you open up your heart complaining to Allah. Now listen to me carefully. And this is inshallah my final point. So everybody's looking at me here looking at the time. I know inshallah we're done. We've done all five points, right? Complaining to Allah is the essence of Iman. Complaining about Allah is kufr. Simple. Complaining to Allah. إِنَّمَا أَشْكُوا بَثِّي وَحُزْنِي إِلَى اللَّهِ Complaining to Allah. What does it mean complaining to Allah? Ya Allah, you see my state. Ya Allah, you see how difficult this is. Ya Allah, I am in need of your mercy. And if you don't help me, no one will help me. This is complaining to Allah. Complaining about Allah. Why is this happening? This is not fair. A'udhu Billah. We don't go there. A'udhu Billah. That is blasphemy. What do you mean? Why is this happening? Who are you? What do you mean this is not fair? Do you understand the implications when you say this is not fair? Do you understand whom you're accusing of being unfair? That is complaining about Allah. And that is kufr. We don't go there. By the way, this is very common in the West. You know, why does bad things happen to good people? Why? Do no, we don't speak like this. We complain to Allah, not about Allah. And this is in the Quran. Ayyub alayhi salam. Rabbi inni masani al-durru wa anta arhamur rahimin. Ya Rabb, you see I'm in difficulty. This is complaining to Allah. I'm in pain, O oh Allah. I'm in pain. And you are arhamur rahimin. Fastajabna lahu. That one dua solved 10 years of misery. And we gave him all of his family. And we doubled all of his wealth for him. One dua. Ya Rabb, I'm in pain. Help me. This is complaining to Allah. Nothing is more therapeutic than dua, which is a part of it, is complaining to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is we learn from the seerah. So these are our five points that we learn from the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And again, this was a summarized class of a much larger one that I have been given. But I want to conclude by simply stating that the seerah is an eternal source of knowledge for all of us about all aspects of our life. You can continue to turn to the seerah and benefit from it in every facet of your existence. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا You have the perfect role model in the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ He tells us and teaches us what it means to manifest the rahmah of Allah on this earth. So we ask Allah Jalla Jalaluhu to allow us to benefit from the sunnah and the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to walk in the footsteps that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam charted out for us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to absorb the life lessons, the akhlaq, the morality, the teachings, the law, the ethics of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow the kalima to be the last phrase that we say before we leave this earth. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to live as Muslims, to die as mu'mins, and to be resurrected with the righteous and the, the anbiya. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be in the company of the Prophet 
Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in the days of judgment and on the day of judgment to drink from his fountain. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be of those whom the Prophet intercedes for. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be in Jannat al firdaus al-A'la along with the Anbiya and the Salihin and the Shuhada. Wa hasmun ulaika rafiqa wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala abdi Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. You guys gonna all right, alhamdulillah. Thank you. <laughs> alhamdulillah. Thank you very much. That was a beautiful, a beautiful lecture. And I think that we all benefited from it. And I think that we would benefit from uh, having you to here to give the full uh, full day uh, presentation. But unfortunately at this time we can't do that. So many people ask questions and you can still send questions. Um, and so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to, I've gone through many of the questions and I'm going to ask some of the ones that first mm -hmm. came up most frequently. And the one that came up most frequently thus far has been, how do we distinguish between a trial and a punishment? Mm -hmm. This is a really profound question. How does one distinguish between a trial and a punishment? Because sometimes, sometimes, what happens to us in this dunya, what happens to people in this dunya is a punishment. Sometimes what happens to us is not meant to raise the ranks of those upon whom it happens, but rather to give them punishment in this world and in the hereafter. We as Muslims should never ever presume and think that Allah is punishing us for the sake of punishment. This is not in our theology. We have good thoughts of Allah. Allah punishes some people for the sake of punishment and their punishment in the next life will be worse. We should always assume that's not us. We should always assume we are not in that category. Now, does this mean, as I explained, that there is no such thing as a punishment in our, in our trials? As I explained, it's not a binary that a punishment and a trial. At some level, it is both simultaneously. At some level, every pain and anxiety that happens to us, it is a mini punishment, if you like, but it's meant as a kafara. It's meant to cleanse. It's meant to raise. It's not meant to be retributive. It's not meant to be vindicative. That's the point here. We don't believe this. As believers in Allah, we don't approach it with that attitude. It does happen to other people. It happens to those whom Allah gives istidraj to. This is in the Quran, the concept of istidraj, right? Is that we're going to increase them even more in their, uh, uh, in, in their uh, good in this world that they think is good, and it is in fact evil. We're going to increase them of the negatives of this world. For us, if we come out of a calamity, if we exit out of a trial having come closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then this is the clearest sign that insha'Allah, this trial was not a punishment. It was a blessing to us. It was a gift to us. As I said, anything that brings us closer to Allah is a gift Allah gives us. There is no punishment then. Allah azza wa jal knew we're weak. Something is blocking our journey to Allah. Allah tests us, lifts the veil. And in fact, you can answer this question yourself to get a sense of where this is going. If I were to ask you, other than Hajj and Umrah, other than Hajj and Umrah, if I were to ask you, at what point in your life did you feel the closest to Allah? At what point in your life were you spiritually at the highest point? Chances are, nine out of ten of you, would think of a very difficult time in your lives. Going through a divorce or the death of a loved one or a financial crisis or some massive cause of anxiety, you were actually close to Allah. Well, guess what? That's the whole point. Allah wanted you to taste that sweetness. Allah wanted you to, raise, to be raised up. So by testing you, not a punishment in this sense, even though it acts as a kafara of your sins, by testing you in this manner, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala raised up your ranks. So, bottom line, 
any calamity that causes you to increase your spiritual awareness, it is actually Allah's gift to you. It's not even a punishment in that sense. It is a gift to you. Now, a calamity that doesn't cause you to come closer to Allah, that should be very scary. It should be frightening. Why didn't they reach out to us when the punishment came down? But their hearts became hard. Why didn't they reach out to us? Why didn't they connect with us when the punishment came? But because they didn't, their hearts became hard. Allah says in the Quran, مَا يَفْعَلُ اللَّهُ بِعَذَابِكُمْ إِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ وَآمَنْتُمْ What will Allah gain by punishing you? We don't believe in a sadistic God. Billah. We don't believe in a God that loves punishment and evil. What will Allah gain by punishing you? If you have faith and show thanks. Meaning, if you don't have faith and you don't show thanks, a little bit of punishment might cause you to wake up. A little bit of trinkling of pain and suffering might cause you to avoid a bigger pain and suffering. So even this is Allah's rahmah, disguised for us as pain, but it is rahmah. Allah says in the Quran, وَنَنُذِيقَنَّهُمْ مِنَ الْعَذَابِ الْأَدْنَى دُونَ الْعَذَابِ الْأَكْبَرِ لَعَلَّهُمْ يَرْجِعُونَ We're going to cause the Quraysh here, we're going to cause the Quraysh to taste a little bit of punishment. Not the big punishment, meaning the akhirah. So that, inshallah, so that they can come back to me. Allah shows us the wisdom of pain. Allah shows us the wisdom of sending calamities. And when COVID struck two and a half, three years ago, I gave a whole khutbah that at the time it went viral. Oh, shouldn't say viral, but COVID. That's pun not intended. But at the time it was widely seen. The wisdoms of COVID. The wisdoms of why this is happening. And point number one, to bring humility to an arrogant mankind. To humble ourselves to the power of God. We thought we had conquered the world. We can go to the moon and back. Break the supersonic barrier. Go faster than life. We thought we had everything. And Allah showed us. Between a day and a night. Allah showed us how impotent, powerless, infinitesimally minuscule we are. Compared to the qudr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is of the wisdoms of having a global calamity and crisis to bring about a sense of spiritual humility. And it terrifies me that mankind doesn't seem to have learned from that. And we exit this crisis, many of us, may Allah protect us without having learned those lessons. So anyway, this answers your question, inshallah. So this is, uh, you, you've talked about the manner in which when one has anxiety, one can, and one just found, and this follows up on that question, so it, how you distinguish whether it's a trial or a punishment. But what about people who go through such a calamity? It's so deep, it's so painful, that they lose a loved one. I mean, we all know what is the, a'udhu billah, what is the greatest pain in life is losing a child. And sometimes when that happens, mm -hmm. or something like that happens, a person is to the point where three days isn't gonna do it. Getting back to get, you can try. But still, waking up yeah. in the morning, uh, to hundred, they're not going to be able to wake up for to hundred. And there are so many things. So just even getting to that point of being able to get up and pray, of of even being able to think straight in some situations, and to, to really turn to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala with a sound heart and a sound mind. What then would you say for people in that type of situation? So again, from the Sira, we learn. We have a role model in the Prophet Sallallahu You said the most difficult tragedy that a human faces is generally speaking the loss of a child. This is very true. Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam didn't lose one, two, three, four, five. He lost six of his seven children in his lifetime. Six of his children at all stages of life. Newborns, toddlers, infants, married without children, married with children. He buried in his lifetime six of his own children bi Abi Hu Umi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولُ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا If Allah tested him with such great tests and trials, 
Who are we to say we're not going to be tested with anything? There is nothing to say to such a person except the consolation of a Prophet that if Allah tests a parent with the loss of a child, that child and his patient, that child will be a means of intercession for him on the Day of Judgment. In fact, al Hafid ibn Hajar, he lost two of his children in a plague. And he wrote a book. Actually, he wrote a book about plagues that's also been printed. But he wrote a book about the consolement to bereaved parents at the loss of their children. And it's like a 40, 50 page booklet that's available in print. I forgot the name, it's rhyming, rhyming Arabic title. That is a collection of a hadith and a collection of wisdoms of the sayings of the past. And the whole notion being that such a child, the other hadith comes in Sahih Bukhari, that the, the parent who loses a child and is patient and says, Alhamdulillah, Allah will build for him a palace that is called the palace of praise because this parent was patient. There is no way to cope with such a loss except through connecting with Allah. I call this theological therapy. And honestly, I, I feel genuinely sorry for those who don't believe in God. How do they live life? Wallahi, I don't know how they would live life. The fact that we believe in God, we believe in Qadr, we believe in Akhirah, we believe in heaven, we believe in an afterlife, it helps us cope with any tragedy that happens to us. When you take that away from people, SubhanAllah, I don't know what you're going to substitute with. Allahu Alam. So, but then, so following up on that, and this is a question that a few people had, what do you do for a person who's in such a state of clinical depression mm. that, uh, that they can't do that? What, for that individual, what would you say? And a few of the people asked, what about, how do we help a person who's in such a state of clinical depression that, that they find it difficult to even engage in those, in those acts? So firstly, let me say that clinical depression is a reality. And it is possible for that reality to exist independent of faith. Some people say, and I used to be amongst them 25 years ago, that if you have Iman, then you're not going to be clinically depressed. I said this because I was taught it as an undergraduate, and my teachers would say this. I was wrong. They were wrong. There is something called clinical depression. We're not talking about sadness. We're talking about you have an issue for years for, and, and treatment is required and that treatment could be therapy, it could be trained counselors, or it could even be medication. To battle anxiety, to battle depression, there are three F's that help but not necessarily solve. Faith, family, and friends. These three F's, faith, family, and friends in that order will always help you. And generally speaking, generally speaking, for 90% of people, inshallah, it's enough. But there are people who, whose faith could be strong and they have good family and they have good friends, but they're still battling clinical depression. There could be an actual clinical problem or there could be mental trauma from childhood or something of this nature. And we have to overcome the stigma of pretending that Depression doesn't exist. Of getting help meaning something is wrong with you. It's only recently that medical practitioners are understanding that depression is an actual reality that could be because of a hormonal imbalance or could be because of something in your life that happened and you don't, haven't dealt with it properly. This is only recent. Unfortunately, because it's recent, most of our Muslim societies, they dismiss the reality of depression of potential suicidal thoughts. And they say faith alone is good enough. And I say faith, family, and friends is generally good enough, but not always. And if we find that it's not helping, then we should encourage therapy. We should encourage getting analyzed by somebody who's a trained medical practitioner. And again, because I'm also a resident scholar and I'm, a, a, you know, I'm in dealing with my community, I know many people that have come to me and told me point blank that all the Quran they read, all the salah they did, it didn't help them when they started taking this drug, whatever it was, meaning that, you know, the, the, the prescription, whatever, solved everything. They had a hormonal imbalance. They had an issue, literally, that's a medical issue, right? And taking whatever issue was prescribed to them by the doctor changed everything and they're normal now. I had another case, again, because I'm dealing with this, 
I'm humbling myself that, you know what, I don't know everything. These people know their specialities better than us. There was a case I dealt with. Of, again, I don't want to go into details, but yani, how else to say this? Uh, a lady had trauma inflicted on her as a child. I hope you understand without being explicit here. And she wasn't able to function as a wife normally, going through depression and whatnot. Husband had no clue. Why is this happening? I'm being nice and good to her. Why is it happening? Turns out she had trauma that she needed to deal with. And guess what? Going to a trained therapist who knows how to unpack that childhood trauma, right? Actually solved the problem and now the marriage is normal and functional. They have kids. They actually were not able to have kids for the beginning year or two and this person came to me, whatnot, and I found out what was going on and I said, go to see a trained therapist and subhanAllah, it actually helped. So I'm seeing in my own life with the people around me that you know what? There is something called actual clinical depression. And we need to remove the stigma that we have unfortunately given to this regard that sometimes listening to the Quran is not alone to overcome you know, anxiety. So obviously because time was limited today, I didn't say it in the lecture, but I'm very glad this question was asked because I do say this in the longer seminar that I give about the, the necessity of turning to trained, licensed therapists, psychiatrists, medical practitioners, and maybe analyzing, is there something beyond just, you know, uh, uh, something that can be cured on one's own? Wallahu ta'ala alam. Alhamdulillah, thank you for expanding on that because that was actually the next question which several people asked mm -hmm. who were taking drugs for anxiety or taking drugs for BPD or things along these lines. So, alhamdulillah, that's, that's, uh, that's excellent. And I think that is something many Muslims need to know that there should be no stigma against it in our community. Uh, so another question that some people asked is, what should I do? How should I feel if I'm not being given any trials? There is no such thing being given trials. There's no such thing. Allah says in the Quran, وَنَبْلُوكُمْ بِالشَّرِّ وَالْخَيْرِ fitna." You're going to be tested with good and with evil. You are being, you are being tested and tried at every instance of your life. Sometimes you experience that test and trial and at other times you might not be aware of it. So right now as we speak, if you are healthy, and wealthy, and you have free time, you are being tested and tried. This is going on and off. What are you doing with your health and wealth? Are you being generous with what Allah Azza wa has given you, right? So if you are not feeling the test, realize this in and of itself is a problem because the test is around you at every instance of your life. Our Prophet said, two are the things that people don't take advantage of. Good health and good time. Our Prophet said, take advantage of five things before five things. Beautiful hadith here, right? And of them, your wealth before you become poor, your free time before you're busy, your health before you become sick, your life before you die. This is our test, okay? Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّمَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَأَوْلَادُكُمْ fitna." Your wealth and your children are a test to you. How you live your life, how you treat your spouse, how you interact with the people around you. All of this is a test. We are being tested every single instance of our lives. True, some tests are more difficult than others, no doubt. And true, the test of depriving, which causes anxiety and stress, generally speaking, is more apparent to us than the test of excess when you have lots of wealth and time. But that is a test. And Allah will ask us about everything that He's given unto us. Remember the famous hadith of the Prophet ﷺ when they didn't have food to eat and Abu Bakr and Umar radiallahu anhu eventually they got food to eat. Abu Haytham gave them food. When, when they didn't have food for an entire day, they got one meal. What did the Prophet ﷺ say? Wallahi latus'alunna yawma idhin anin na'im. Allah is going to ask you about this food that He has given you. This is a test. When's the last time we ate food and then we thought, I'm going to have to answer to Allah about the money I spent on this food, whether it's halal or haram, about what I did with this food. So yes, we are being tested continuously. Our life is a test. Allahu alam. So this does lead into something, which is uh, some people like really do have issues of clinical depression and actual disorders that sometimes they don't want to go get diagnosed or sometimes they don't have the ability to go and seek therapy. But then, as you said in your lecture, hurt people hurt people. So how do we then interact with and work with others 
who have this unresolved trauma, whereby they are actually inflicting uh, pain upon others and more trauma. <clears throat> This is a question that is better suited to be asked to therapists and trained counselors. <laughs> yeah. I can't give you fiqh and legal rulings, but I can say, and again, I'm speaking from the American perspective, and I hope, inshallah, this is not happening in your land, but in our country, there is a very startling rise of depression and even suicide in teenagers the number one cause of death amongst teenagers in America of a certain 16 to something, right? the number one cause of death is suicide. This is a shocking statistic. Shocking. Not car accidents, not cancer, suicide. It's really sad for me to say this. Last year in Dallas, we, our community, the Masajid, had six suicide cases of teenagers. Six in one city. Our Muslim community. I hope, inshallah, your community is free. I hope, inshallah, in this land, you're not seeing this. But we are seeing it. So we have had to go outside of our comfort zone. And we have had to train masjids. We've had special seminars in masjids about how to deal with children that are facing depression how to recognize signs of suicide. Masjids, churches, synagogues. We don't just teach about... We have to bring classes about depression. I have to give khutbahs, and I, I'm supposed to, and I'm, I'm very happy I'm giving it, but I'm not an expert in this, but because I'm the khatib, uh, you know, it's a part of now we need to do it. I've given last year, I gave three khutbahs, different types of khutbahs about psychiatry, recognizing depression. Teenage suicide. I have a whole khutbah about this, right? Afterwards, so many parents came, so many youth came to thank me. SubhanAllah. I had, anyway, I have so many horror stories about this as well. I've had teenagers come to my office telling me they want to commit suicide. I'm not trained as a therapist. Shuyukh are not trained to deal with depression. They don't train that in seminaries. So, we have to get outside our comfort zone. Parents need to understand and recognize signs of depression before it's too late. Even if I'm not a therapist, I'm telling all of you to find out the basics of depression and suicide and recognize it in family and friends. I had to do this for my khutbahs and whatnot. And, you know, in America, again, I don't know, but in America, there are, um, you know, free uh, clinics that will send you trained counselors to teach. We had in our masjid a whole day-long seminar. And it's for free because, again, this is a part of the service they provide. And of the things that we learn is a young man or woman becoming withdrawn, saying things like, it's better if I died, nobody loves me. Radical changes in social and eating habits, okay? Feeling a sense of, you know, morbidness, always thinking about death. A 19-year-old should not be constantly obsessed with death. If they're always doing this, then as parents... And actually, one of, you know, again, I have these stories, personal things. I had somebody come to me, say to me that were it not for the fact that it would hurt my mother, I would take my life. It's just the fact my mother loves me that I'm not. So this is how we battle stress, love. The, the kid told me, and I'm trying to deal with him, he told me that if I were to do this, it's a solution for me, I'd love to do it, but it's going to hurt my mother. And I know my mother loves me, and I don't want her to be hurt. This I heard with my own two ears in my office in, in, in Dallas, right? So what this taught me was that here's somebody telling you a solution. Love, love. You have to love your next generation. Unfortunately, many of us think that being strict is the only way to be a parent. Strictness has its place and it has a role. But there's also got to be feelings of empathy. And again, this is Quranic. The Prophet says, Allah is empathizing with him. Literally, it's in the Quran. We know, Ya Rasulullah, it's difficult. This is therapy to validate the pain, to validate the frustration, rather than, which unfortunately many of us did, and I've heard this again from the youth, to dismiss it. I don't know why you're depressed. You have everything. When I was a kid, I had nothing. Why are you feeling anxiety? You have this, you have that. My father would do this and that. 
you know, I don't understand, I'll be honest with you, why the next generation, why suicide and depression is rising. I don't understand. But my not understanding doesn't change the statistic. My not understanding doesn't change the death rate. So whether I understand or not, I better get with it. And I better understand, I have to deal with it. Now again, I'm outsider to your city or country. I don't know what's happening. I hope, inshallah, antum fi afia. I hope so. But at the same time, the world is a village. And what's happening there is probably happening to some degree here as well. Maybe if not to that level, but still. It is important that parents, teachers, educators recognize symptoms of depression and of suicide and monitor it. And if you are involved with the next generation, it is fard ayn on you to recognize this. There must be multiple avenues of checks and balances. And if you see something in this regard, intervene and say something so that inshallah ta'ala we can prevent anything that would be, you know, preventable. Inshallah. Inshallah. Exactly. So um, another question that's come up several times is people asking about that they're very anxious about major sins that they have committed mm -hmm. in the past, even though they were Muslim or even after they converted to Islam, they still committed some very major sins and these kind of haunt them and give them great anxiety. How should one deal with that? You're saying after they converted to Islam? After they converted. They've been Muslim or after they've converted to Islam. and, and So the sins are... After, after, not before, because yes, obviously before. before there is no, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or even Muslims, born Muslims that have committed major sins. So in this regard, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, we thank Allah Azza wa Jal, our beautiful religion, the beautiful names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the beautiful concept of tawbah. I mean, I'm sure you have heard so many khutbas about tawbah and repentance and the reality of Allah's rahmah. I have given dozens in my life. Every khatib has given. This topic is... How can anybody not talk about it when the Quran itself is full of it? The majority of Allah's names and attributes center around mercy and compassion. Have you ever wondered about this? The majority of Allah's names and attributes center around compassion and mercy. Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Ar-Rahmur Rahimin, Ar-Ra'uf, Al-Ghafur, Al-Ghaffar, At-Tawwab, on and on and on. And Allah tells us in the Quran, قُلْ يَا عِبَادِيَ الَّذِينَ أَسْرَفُوا عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِمْ لَا تَقْنَطُوا مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ O my servants who have transgressed against yourselves, don't despair of Allah's mercy. Allah forgives all sins. Allah didn't create us to be angels. Angels already exist. Allah does not love sins. Allah does not love the sinner. But Allah loves the repentant. And in order to be repentant, you must have been a sinner. Allah loves the repentant. Wallahu yuhibbu tawabin. Allah loves the tawab. The Prophet said that if one of you were to die in the desert out of, out of thirst and then you find water and the happiness that you feel, Allah is happier at that person than that person is. Literally, he thought he's going to die and then he finds water. Allah is happier than that person when he discovers you know, water and whatnot. So we have this entire genre of optimism. The entire genre. Never lose hope in Allah's mercy. And if you have a sin, even if you have a habitual sin, then be a habitual repenter to Allah. Constantly turn to Allah. Allah Azza wa Jal does not demand perfection. You're not going to be perfect. Allah does not look at the quantity of your sins. He looks at the quality of your repentance. That's all. And if you fall into the sin again, repent again. And if you fall again, repent again until you meet your Lord. In that struggle is your salvation. So again, much can be said, and this is, this is the genre of so many khutbas and lectures of spiritual leaders and whatnot, and I and every teacher I would know and every shaykh would have given lectures of, of this nature. لا تقنطوا من رحمة الله Don't give up hope of Allah's mercy. Much can be said, but I have to quote one hadith here. It's a hadith that should actually send chills down our spines. Our Prophet said, Akbaru al kabair the biggest of all sins. Because there's sins or levels. And you have the minor sins, you have the major sins, you know, murder and stealing and stealing orphans' property. These are major sins. Then you have a category called the biggest of major sins. Akbaru al kabair right? It's a list of three things or something like this, right? Number one, polytheism, worshipping an idol. Number two on the list, authentic hadith, our Prophet said, number two on the list, 
وَالْيَأْسُ مِنْ رَحْمَةِ اللَّهِ To give up hope of Allah's mercy. That sin is a bigger sin than any sin you could have possibly done in your life. To give up hope of Allah's mercy is a bigger sin than any sin you could have possibly done in your life. Why? Because when you challenge the mercy of Allah, you are challenging the Rahman in his characteristic of Rahmah. And who are you? And how much can your infinitesimally puny existence bring forth of sins that the Rahman and Rahim cannot forgive your sins? For you to say that Al Ghafur and Al Ghafar is not capable of forgiving me means you have deluded arrogance and you are accusing Allah Azza wa Jal of a crime that is worse than any sin you could have possibly done. So don't despair of Allah's mercy. To despair of Allah's mercy itself is a major sin. We don't think this way. Allah shall forgive you. If Allah can forgive the one in Bani Israel who did mass murder of 99 people, if Allah can forgive anyone that Allah wants to forgive, then who are we and who are you? Allah forgives the sins of all who desire forgiveness. So do not lose hope of Allah's mercy and don't worry about the quantity of your sins. Concentrate on the quality of your repentance and Allah shall forgive you. Alhamdulillah. So another question, you began with t discussing the issue of theodicy and, uh, and you came back and you talked about that on the personal levels where that inflicts us with anxiety and depression and issues and how we can do that. But there's also, when one deals with theodicy, there is the issue of major calamities. And you know, right now we're in a situation where we have our brothers and sisters in Syria, in Yemen, the Rohingya, the Uyghurs, um, and in Palestine. So there's also that situation. And this, for us, this is, we sometimes, even though, yes, people are suffering, it seems somewhat abstract for you and I to be sitting here in Doha, which is in many ways a land of luxury, and to be contemplating these issues while we have brothers and sisters suffering in, in this way in so many parts of the Muslim world. How do we, how do we contextualize that? So you, you mentioned a valid point. There's actually obviously two aspects of the Odyssey, right? The first is um, uh, uh, trauma and pain that humans cause each other. And this is what the angels referenced, right? Because that's the worst of the two actually, right? Because it's man-made because we're the ones who caused it. And then you have, of course, what is caused, you know, what is called, um, uh, you know, um, uh, natural disasters, you know, or an act of God is the technical term in the books of language, uh, in the books of legal stuff, an act of God. And of course, these ones um, are used by those who deny God. But in reality, uh, these ones at some level is easier for us to understand simply because an act of God actually is something that Allah Azza wa Jal has will to do for the people who are suffering it, for the people who are undergoing it, they have been chosen by Allah to rise to the highest of the high. Civil war, natural disasters, calamities of this nature, the amount of difficulties that they have, we can only begin to imagine. And if they pass those tests, we learn from the seerah, we learn from the Quran, we learn from the hadith, that on the day of judgment, those who are afflicted with such calamities when they see the reward that they will get, they will ask Allah to send them back to the dunya and increase the calamities so that they get more reward. No person who is told he's going to go to Jannah will try to negotiate round two in this world except for the shaheed and the one who suffered these calamities. This is in the hadith. The one who was musab, the one who had massive calamities, right? On the day of judgment, when Allah gives them Jannah and they see the ajr of this then they're going to try to renegotiate. Send us back, O oh Allah. So we have to understand theodicy in light of the next life, number one, right? For those people that are afflicted, the only thing to tell them is, well, if we're in their position, may Allah protect us all, there is a future. For us who are not being afflicted, we have a test and trial. And that is, what are we doing to combat that evil? What are we doing to minimize their pain and suffering? That is a test for us. Every one of us should be connected to our brothers and sisters around the world 
to the Uyghurs, to the Rohingya, to Palestine, to every issue happening around the world. And every one of us should have a genuine connection and pain. And even if we can't solve everybody's problem, in whatever small things we can do, whether it's fundraising, whether it's public awareness, whether it's dua, in that is our salvation. So we're not going to eliminate pain and suffering in this world. That's not what this world is for. We shall never have a world that is completely at peace. That is in Jannah. In fact, again, I mean, much can be said, but I, one of the points of the lecture that I didn't mention in this seminar, what do the people of Jannah say when they enter Jannah? What does the Quran tell us is the dhikr of the people of Jannah when they step in Jannah? وَقَالُوا الْحَمْدُ لِلَّهِ الَّذِي أَذْهَبَ عَنَّا الْحَزَنِ إِنَّ رَبَّنَا لَغَفُورٌ شَكُورٌ the first thing the people of Jannah say applies to this lecture we just gave right now. Alhamdulillah, finally, nothing to worry about. When do they say that? When they pass their exam? When they get the promotion? When they get married? When they have a kid? When they get their palace and mansion? When do they say, finally, nothing to be stressful about? That's not in this dunya. That is in the akhirah. What we desire is in the Akhirah. Alhamdulillah alladhi adhaba anna al-hazan. That's over there. So every one of us is going to have huzun in this world. We just want to minimize it. We don't want huzun as we explained. But those whose hazan is a lot more, there's really only to tell them your ajr is... And that's why again, إِنَّمَا يُوَفَّ الصَّابِرُونَ أَجْرَهُمْ بِغَيْرِ حِسَابٍ Notice, we know this from the Qur'an. Every good deed is going to give us 10, right? مَنْ جَاءَ بِالْحَسَنَةِ فَلَهُ عَشْرُ أَمْثَالِهَا If we give one dinar, Allah will reward you 10. If you pray one raka'ah, Allah will reward you 10. There's only one or two things that there is no equation. That the equation ceases to exist. And number one on this list, Imagine Allah who is al-awwal and akhir who has no hisab. Allah says, you shall get your reward bighayri hisab. That's the only consolation we can give to the people other than whatever little things that we can do. And Allah's hikmah is Allah's hikmah. We cannot question. We may make dua. We may ask Allah to lift. We should ask Allah to lift. We should ask Allah to protect us. But in the end, we are Allah's creation. And what He decides to do, we must trust His wisdom. Just like the story of Surah Al-Kahf and Khidr and Musa. By the way, all of these three stories deal with calamities and trials. All of these three stories, every time a child dies, a boat is sunk, right? Orphans don't have money. Every one of these calamities seems like a massive calamity. But in the end, we learn there was a divine wisdom that makes us understand the calamity. Allah is teaching us that you don't know the end results. And if you put your trust in Allah, the end results will be for your good. We don't believe in the existence of pure evil. There is no such thing as pure evil. We believe as Muslims that we have the potential to maximize the good in every situation of evil such that the good outweighs the evil. That's what we believe at an individual level. Every individual amongst us has the potential to maximize out of any situation more good than evil. And if we do it with that attitude, well then, alhamdulillah, we have, we have succeeded in our lives. تعصيني ولا تخشى من العتب وتخفي الذنب عن خلقي وتأبى في الهوى قربي فتب مما جنيت عسى تعود إلى رضا الرب تعود إلى رضا الرب